everyone, my name is Leslie Bravo and welcome to Better Day Podcast. Today, once again, I'm here with Katrina. Hello, and, everyone. And Anthony. Hello, hello. Today podcast, we'll be talking about breaking the silence, ACEs, suicide prevention, and building a brighter future. Mm-hmm. During this episode, we will be discussing... Um, how we recognize, you know, in, in Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month by exploring the deep connections between ACEs, which is Adverse Childhood Experiences, and the suicide risks. Early trauma, such as abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction can leave lasting scars, inclus- including the mental health struggles later in life. But there's always help and this is a topic that is very dear because I think we, in the, in the field, in the space that we worked, we have seen it very close. And personally, I've seen a couple of people that they're no longer with us and that everything could have been prevented. So Katrina, mm-hmm. tell me. We're going to be talking about the link between ACEs and suicide risks. Mm-hmm. And it's being recognized. Data shows that people that suffer from ACEs are twice as likely to commit or die by suicide. So, and the numbers are still, I mean, isn't this, the statistic is still growing because people are feeling too alone, right? So this topic is very, very dear and close to my heart. Um, I am a an attempt survivor. Um, my anniversary is on the 22nd of this month. And it's very important for me and you to speak and, and kind of bring light and shed some of the stigma on this topic because ACEs, it, like you said, it all starts with ch- childhood. So, you know, the first time that I ever had suicidal thoughts, which, you know, no child should, is somewhere between 10 and 11 years old. And if we go back to ACEs, I guarantee you, most of them were there. So the thoughts, those feelings, so hopelessness were because of the trauma that you experienced as a kid? Yes. How were you able to overcome? I didn't. Um... I was, I I first had the thoughts at that very young age, and then at 15, I did attempt, Um, and then at, in 2015, I attempted. Um, So I've overcome them by professionals, by, you know, obviously my sobriety and my recovery plays a huge role in that. Um, the support from the community and the church and my fellows, my fellow peers. Um, but there's a lot of t- personal tools that I have to use daily sometimes. Now that you are an adult. Right. But you said that that happened when you were a child, then it happened when you were an adolescent. Mm-hmm. Then now that you're an adult, you're still dealing with a struggle. Well, yeah, because you, those who deal with mental health, uh, issues, they don't go away. You just have to learn how to manage and how to deal with them on a day-to-day basis. So this, we're talking about ACEs and how you know healing through awareness and support can help other people. Mm-hmm. Maybe you know other people that experience the same feelings that you experienced at one point. And raising awareness about the effects of ACEs allow us to create a support system to foster resilience. And in this segment, we're going to discuss about how trauma-informed care and community-based programs can offer, you know, pathways to healing. And this is what we're doing, what we're doing today. It's a little sensitive topic still because, you know, it's sad. It's sad to know that we lost a lot of people to suicide. But there's a lot of help and there's hope. Oh, yeah. And especially, you know, preventing ACEs, it gave us a lot of hope. 
and from therapy to support networks. There are ways to help individuals to recover from that trauma and rebuild their lives. And this is exactly what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anthony, Mm -hmm. you're kind of quiet. I know. So, um, speaking about, you know, highlight stories of individuals who have not only survived the pain of their past, but have turned it into strength. I think you are one of those individuals. Like today, earlier, we're sitting down here and then we're talking about this particular topic and then you mentioned, oh, this happened to us and, and literally <laughs> Anthony and I were like, or your heart dropped. <laughs> and you're like, what happened? And and it, and it's so, I think you're so like familiar and normalized with what when what happened with you and that, you know, for us it's still very like, wow, how resilient you are and how many people can can see you and, and be in the same position you are, you were. There's a way out. There's hope. You're not alone. Yeah, you're definitely not alone. And I've learned from personal experience that when struggles come, because struggles are going to come, whether it's, you know, loss of job, loss of a a spouse, you know, you know, anything, loss of a dog, you know, it's, and it's a lot of, usually it's a lot of loss or a lot of change or fear of the unknown. But from personal experiences, you have to have your mental health stable and you have to have the tools and you have to know your triggers. You know, some, just a couple of my triggers are I love music, love music, and I love writing. But if I put that pen to paper and I start writing neg- negatively, I'm not going to stop. Or if I turn on a song that rem- triggers me to, you know, in a, in a sad mindset, that could lead to something else. So I kind of change the music. Go out in the sun, you know. Mm-hmm. Go to the gym. Be around people. Work out. Work out. Come to do the podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. These personal stories of overcoming aces offer hope and inspiration, showing that even in the darkest time, healing and success are possible. Mm-hmm. By sharing these narratives, we aim that our listeners have the courage to seek help and the confidence that recovery it is within reach. And then we're here to support them all the way. Oh, definitely. And, you know, we, we need the professional help as well as our community. Mm-hmm. Um, and from personal experience, you know, the professional help sometimes didn't work for me because not, not all therapists are, uh, have lived experience and, I know from my personal experience, going through the different therapists, trying to heal, a lot of them wanted to throw medication at me, Um, didn't have lived experience, didn't understand where I was coming from, didn't understand how I felt, didn't understand why I didn't want to live. There is, there are different ones, right? There's, there's people that specializes in recovery for addiction. There is, there are other ones that specialize in PTSD. So when you're seeking and, and this is just a recommendation Mm -hmm. from our experiences is that when people are seeking for support, it's super important that they seek the right help. Somebody that is experienced on PTSD or anxiety or depression or, you know, addiction. And speaking about, uh, you know, those in recovery and addiction and things like that, there's different factors that, that bring depression on and, and, you know, lower affect our mental health. Um, and I know that I, I used to live up North, so I've been down here 14 years from Ohio and up North, I was known from the physicians to have seasonal depression. Well, up north, seasonal depression is eight months out of the year. Because it's dark and <laughs> gray and cold and oh, rainy. Man. What do you do? You don't go outdoors. And nothing. Right. So, but then when I moved down here, that made that did make a big difference. Huge difference. We're happy. I mean, we're, we're lucky to be in Sunshine State. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's why they call it Sunshine State, I guess. Mm-hmm. 
And you have those other tools that help, you know, like going to the beach, sitting at the ocean, going outside in the, and putting, you know, the sun on your face. I think that helps a lot. Yeah. That helps a lot when you're sick. That helps a lot when you're not feeling great or uh, even when you're, you know, in, inside too much. Like me, I get mm-hmm. very, uh, I don't know what you would say. When you're inside. Mm-hmm. You feel in a box. Like, yeah. I need to see the sun. I need to see even in the stars at night. I need to see a window. Mm-hmm. Like, even the wind or the rain, whatever. I want. I need to see something. Mm-hmm. And even uh, my, I I don't know if you have a routine, but I'm a very structured person and I have a very good routine when it comes to my mental health and my recovery. And when I wake up, first thing I do is open the shades. I don't care if I'm awake, my contacts are in, I'm going to trip over my dog, whatever it is, I go open all of the windows in the house. Let the sun shine into the the house altogether. Right, right. Even with the tools and everything that, you know, people can be used and is helpful, the social interactions are essential. Mm-hmm. F- the support group from friends, because we all sometimes feel down, and it's nice that we can reach out to a friend and have somebody available to just listen to us as we were speaking before. Uh, what is that you said, Katrina? Uh, ask, talk, and listen. And listen. As we, you know, see a lot of posts on social media that mention that a lot of people don't really listen. Right. They're more reactive to respond, not really to listen. Yeah, that physical dialogue, that human connection, um, a lot of times I I feel that with because we have so many social media platforms, we're missing that. We're losing that connection. Even I mean, it's good to have the fusion of both. I, I was at the Broward Coalition, uh, um, Behavioral Health Coalition, at a presentation one day, mm-hmm. and they were talking about you know technology and how to you know support kids through technology, um, which is so important. But I think it's also super important to have a mixture of both, because mm-hmm. in technology you see kids nowadays like addicted to their phones. Mm-hmm. They don't really go to the park. They don't really do physical activity. They don't really get exposed to the sun. And they're like on games. Right. I think they say uh, they use the expression, go outside and touch grass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Do you think uh, the suicide rate has been, is, uh, is worse since the introduction of social media? I don't know. The actual answer to that, we'd have to look it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. definitely. Let's write this down. So, social media versus no social media. I yeah. can say from maybe from anecdotal experience, I can think of some uh, like well, uh, I have my computer here in front of me, so I'm not like you know an expert. Um, but the I know the advent of cyberbullying came up, uh, or is is a kind of more recent than not. And that's like, if you think about it, if back, I guess when we were all younger, well, me for half of my life, when you were bullied at school and you went home, it stopped essentially because you're outside. But now with, I guess with social media, the reach is farther. So now if you, if something's happening, if something's happening at school, you're dealing with something, uh, someone in particular who's harassing you, they can kind of reach you, your friends when you're in your home. Right. Or that's just for that particular thing. Or you can see uh, or be exposed to things that make you think of that and dealing with an algorithm that, and when you resonate with it, like you interact with it, Mm -hmm. it's going to feed you more of that. Mm -hmm. So I think, just on my opinion, that I think that makes it worse. I think there was something in dealing with the social media companies and exploiting the algorithm and and the effects it has on the youth Mm -hmm. because of the algorithm just feeding them. Yeah, and we lost a lot of kids Mm -hmm. because of cyberbullying. Yeah, and you really have to think about that. That goes, that bullying goes even farther because nowadays, like you said, children all have phones. Adults have phones. People, they they talk about you. They're not verbally just talking about you anymore. Now they're talking about you back and forth between friends and, and sending you screenshots and, you know, 
even on and social media posts. Yeah. Think about hundreds of people, people that, can, that don't know you that can jump on there and w- just yeah. I was just gonna yeah. say that it's not it's not between like back in the day when you were mentioning Anthony. It's just mm-hmm. between you and the bully at school, and mm-hmm. then you go home and it's over. No, and it's now thousands of people looking at those views, making fun of you, the whole world. Mm-hmm. So you, can you imagine how can a young person feel when they they see all that? The yeah, shame, sad. embarrassment, and all that stuff. Yeah. It's very hard. I mean, look at the schools. Look what happened in Georgia. That breaks my heart. And that is a 14 years old. And if you see the past trauma, because, you know, the mom had a lot of, you know, issues. And I th- and the signs were there. Well, let's talk about that. Is there? I mean, I would like to speak about you know a future full of full of hope, mm-hmm. right? But when we're talking about a future full of hope, how can we prevent all these all these sad things ha- from happening? And as you mentioned earlier, Katrina, how can somebody address a kid when the kid comes home and and says, "Oh, I heard that somebody died from by suicide." How can right or even mom? What is suicide? What exactly? What is suicide? So the best way is to address it straightforward. Just you know, being cautious, careful. Mm-hmm. Say that somebody that um, unfortunately is no longer with us that was feeling very sad. They have a lot of emotions and they feel helpless. They had nobody, but in reality, give people the support that they need, especially the kids. Like, you cannot never feel alone. You're never alone. If you need to talk to somebody, you have the school teacher, you have people that, you know, you can feel close to, that you can share your emotions with. Just be empathetic. And once again, ask, talk, and listen. Mm -hmm. Listen and make that little person feel comfortable that you're there to help them. Because... When you're talking about suicide, it's potentially they represent a risk to themselves, but also they could potentially represent a risk to others. And this is exactly what happened in Georgia. In and Georgia? It, and it breaks my heart. Mm. There's, I mean, it's just, I, I, it's so sad. You know, especially for children, sometimes that word suicide is very strong. Um, you know, a, a professional friend of mine, um, she said, sometimes she likes to talk to her youth by just simply, that's where I got the ask, talk, listen from, because she said, sometimes you just ask them, you know, are, are you having thoughts of harming yourself? Because it opens the gateway conversation for something a little bit broader. Um, you know, are you, you know, are you, are you thinking, are I, are you thinking or having thoughts of hurting yourself? Do you actually have a plan? And just listen. Sometimes the signs are there. Sometimes, I mean, if you, if you're careful to pay attention, you can see. Mm-hmm. You can see people that are isolating themselves, changing the, the habits or aggressive you, you can see, and oftentimes even the teachers are the first ones to know because they're the ones that deal with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they see them more. Yeah. So when, you know, looking ahead and we envision a future where, suic- where there's a lot of, you know, prevention to this epidemic through education, awareness, and community efforts, we can reduce the stigma surrounding mental health and making resources more accessible. Yeah, like and you, speaking, speaking about it. Right. And like you said, it starts at school and it starts at home. The key message to all this is that your past does not define your future. With support, healing is possible and we can all play a role creating a more compassionate world. Mm-hmm. Wow. I just got a um, crazy fact from the National Institute of Health, and I was looking at uh, another graph as well. So from what I'm looking at, I'm going to read this here. It says uh, that the total age-adjusted suicide rate in the United States in in 2021 increased to 14 per 100,000. 
in uh, 2021, the suicide rate among males was four times higher at 28 per 100,000 than among females, which is 5.7 per, um, 5.7 per 100,000. Wow. So it's only, it's more than mm-hmm. double. Mm-hmm. One double. So f- like four, four times, uh, almost four times the rate. Wow. And um, yeah, it's crazy. But at, but also I was looking at a uh, another graph here that shows that suicide among, uh, and, and, re- and this was in relation to social media, mm-hmm. but suicide is higher among teen girls. Really? So um, than average. So it's higher among teen girls, lower among teen boys. Um, until I, I don't know what age, but they don't have the ages here for that part. But that that I think that's very uh, telling. I wonder if that has something to do with the unrealistic expectations. Mm. I think so. It, it it has to because you know having all these women and Instagram that a lot of them. I mean, there's a lot of surgeries. There's a lot of injections. There's a lot of a lot of a lot of other things. Right, it does correlate if we're increasing our social media and increasing this version of what we're supposed to be, and then we realize that's not what I am. So I think, you know, girls are suffering to try to live up to that in the young age, Mm -hmm. and um, guys are maybe, I don't know, dealing with rejection when it comes to that in the older age. Mm -hmm. So probably two parts of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So speaking of men versus women, um, I know we... We were talking about this a little bit ago. The mm. suicide rate is higher for men, but the attempt is higher for women. Mm. And that's because women tend to communicate a little bit more effectively than men, while men have um, the trigger or the, the short... Um, um, what do you call that? Like when you have the the lethal means. Oh, you mean like more uh, just, just more violence or yeah, more like a quicker violence. Yeah, I think that that also has to do with this the being more violent in nature, and then also the uh, I say yeah, I think I think that could be linked to just potentially being more violent. Mm-hmm. You're saying ah. Uh, the heck with it Uh, and yeah which makes sense so that actually makes me think about um you know like the lethal means Mm -hmm. to suicide i don't have guns in my house um i have a gun permit but i don't have guns in my house for that reason specifically Mm. Uh, quite a few years back um i had a good friend he had guns in his house and just in a split second he was arguing with his girlfriend and he shot himself. But if he didn't have those in his house, maybe it wouldn't have happened. Also, I think the percentage, the stats show that men are tend to actually act upon, you yeah, know. Act upon the, the thoughts instead of... Yeah. yeah. It's often because the underreported trauma of mental health struggles. Mm-hmm. Which kind of goes back to the generational you know, you're programmed from childhood. Anthony, you were talking about that on a, a previous episode. Mm-hmm. You're programmed from childhood to what? Take Be the head of the household? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, suck it up, grin and bear it, mm-hmm. work through it. Um, and it can definitely be toxic, uh, especially in um, if there's not a, a care. It's not coming from a caring, loving place mm-hmm. because there's two, it's, I, I can say, I think, and this makes me think about this. I don't know; it's kind of a little off topic. Of there's this, uh, there's this, uh, this guy, and he was uh, teaching his son martial arts. Mm-hmm. Um, part of that is like, okay, well, you could say, oh, that's more prone to violence. No, well, I think as a man, you should be dangerous and learn how to control it. So, but in the moment, his son was, um, he was, he was uh, going through a drill with his son, and he was to only dodge him when he actually swung at him okay just it's you know for test your know, reaction reflexes and stuff like that and his son was getting visibly frustrated mm-hmm. and instead of like uh reprimanding him in a rough way with you know he's he, he stopped and said talk to him, hey hey listen just calm down relax you know just 
control your emotions. He said, look, just, just watch my, watch me. And he showed him like where he should be reacting. And he did, and he got it. It's working through that emotion when you, when you are feeling a well of emotions, because I, I will say this from my personal experience, can't speak for every man out there, but there is, I call it a fire mm -hmm. in every man. This is why you won't stop on the side of the road for a guy. <laughs> men are dangerous. Fight wars, all that good stuff, but it's a fire that's within you. That's what either allows there to be you to build great things or be responsible for atrocities. But it's a fire nonetheless, and you can use it constructively or destructively. And um, I think that that, that understanding that is the most important having men in the household and all that as well. But I think what we're seeing is a result of a, what happens when you do not have the means to control that. Like the emotional stability. Emotional stability. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Well said. So I think that's what, that's what the uh, problem is. Part of the problem. Mm -hmm. so. I definitely think... Uh, definitely feel that all of that goes together. That fire that you're talking about, mm. the the means, the lethal means, the mental health, um, you know, the lack of love and acceptance. A stigma. And a very big stigma because mm -hmm. most of the time, who, especially growing up, growing up, you know, I was even mute for a few years. I wasn't telling anyone. I wasn't going to tell a soul. It takes so long to overcome trauma. So long. Some people are still battling, you know, to come out to share their emotions. It's hard. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. But like, you're not alone. Yeah, you're definitely not alone, especially... There are resources. Yeah, there's, you know, there's the 988, the suicide prevention mm -hmm. um, and crisis line. Like you were saying earlier, there's NAMI, the... Uh, the uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and what's the other one? Mental Health America. Yeah. And then, for a fact, if you feel like you need a mental reset, you can go ahead and do it. There's nothing you know? wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it. If you have a cut in your hand and you're bleeding, you go to the hospital to get healed. What can you do that with your mind? There's help, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's, you know, it's like you just need a time out. Time mm -hmm. out your brain, disconnect from all the stressors and reset your mind and so you can be better mm -hmm. for you and for those around you. So let's call for action. The action is to encourage everybody, all our listeners, everybody to speak up. Mm -hmm. You're not alone. No, definitely Stigma not free. Chances are you don't know the person on the right or the left. They may be struggling with the exact same thing that you are, and they're just not speaking up. So everybody should unite together and share resources and, and spread the mission of awareness for help to build a future where everyone feels empowered to thrive and to get better mm -hmm. for better days. Mm -hmm. All right. So what events do we have coming up? Oh boy, we have the Believe event coming up. October 19 mm -hmm. in Pompano Beach. And if you have any questions, visit our website for the better day and check our events. We not only have Believe coming up, but we have other events lined up too. And then right now we're seeking for volunteers. Uh, yes, Katrina. We uh, we definitely need volunteers. We need volunteers for believe. We've got um, we've got our hands in some other things that we need volunteers for this Saturday. If you want to come watch the the soccer game and and uh, if anybody wants to come to the Inter Miami CF and see Messi, yeah, and you you'll get to go in the VIP area and. Hang out with and me. hang out with you know the crew and it's gonna be fun, super fun. I, th I think it'll be after by the time this comes out, it'll be a week after. Oh, yeah. we will be there Saturday. But yeah. anyways, there's a lot of um, volunteer opportunities if you want to make um, help out the community. 
There is a NAMI walk, the National Association of Mental. Uh, there's a NAMI walk on uh, November 2nd at John Prince Park. Um, and we will be there. We will be there. <laughs> I, I attend that walk every year. We will be there to support to support our Katrina <laughs> and Congress Katrina for uh, your resilience. <laughs> and in, I mean, you you know you never know who you're inspiring right now. You yeah, you never know. And and like I said, come out. We'll be there. Support. You're not alone. Thank you guys. Thank you both of you for sharing your stories and taking the time to speak with with us and sharing this time with the audience. Um. Thank you to our listeners. Please, please download our podcast, follow us, and until next time. Thank you.